Forward and Introduction of Polonia Seven Stories from Contemporary Japanese Writers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in November 2013. Polonia Seven Stories from Contemporary Japanese Writers. Translated by Sofu Taketomo. Forward. It is a pleasure to write a foreword for my friend Mr. Taketomo's collection of Japanese tales. Our admiration of Japanese art is now so deep and so wide in Western countries that we are sometimes startled to realize how little we know of contemporary Japanese writing, which means how little we know of the inner life of Japan today. While statesmen and diplomats agonize, contriving elaborate machinery for the restoration and the maintenance of international goodwill, it is in the power of any of us, by reading such books as this, to become better acquainted in a pleasant hour with our neighbor's mind, and upon acquaintance goodwill grows. The service is perhaps beyond estimate which Japanese literature may render to us in the United States by thus preparing the seeds of friendship and of justice between nations. Whether Mr. Taketomo has made faithful translations, I cannot say, since I know nothing of the language and very little of the literature from which these pieces are drawn. But it is evident that these translations live and bring before us a world of people. We observe that the persons in the stories are like ourselves, or like the characters who may very well, we believe, surround us. Perhaps Mr. Taketomo has chosen from authors under the influence of Western literature, but in any case, true pictures of life in the East would probably serve approximately to portray us at home. The episode subtly told in Hanako, the extraordinary truth in Takasebune, the story of the man who killed his brother, are as pictures of our world, seen through our eyes. What strangeness there is dwells in the language. The literary method of these sketches suggests the art of the great Russian or French storytellers. Yet to call these selections realistic is not to account for all of their quality. Perhaps the Japanese writers imitated Western realists, but there is something alien, something which we are likely to call Japanese, in their power to represent life as it is, or as it seems to be. This power springs from the imagination rather than from a theory of art. The truth of the scenes here recorded is naive as well as poignant. Is it because the Oriental mind is new to us, and seems therefore more acute, more sensitive, simply because its approach is unfamiliar? Perhaps, but I think there is something here which will not wear threadbare on closer acquaintance, as imaginative power, such as all artists long for, to feel and see vividly the whole drama of our daily life. This power comes from a way of living, rather than from a way of writing. If Japan can teach us this, we may well spare an hour to learn from her. John Erskine Introduction Here are seven stories by three contemporary authors of Japan. On transplanting them into the soil of the English language, I must make a brief account of each author. Mr. Mori Ogai, a Surgeon General in the Japanese Army, is also renowned for his deep scholarship in literature and for his own writings, which are of enduring value. His translation of Andersen's Improvisatoren was regarded as the best specimen of this kind of literature and is still widely read among the young men of Japan. I do not know how often I have read this book. On leaving the shores of my home country, I did not forget to put it in my trunk among a few classics of Japan, for it was the book in which I was introduced first to Italy and to Dante. We owe to Mr. Mori two admirable translations from American authors, Rip Van Winkel by Washington Irving, and one of those stories of early California life by Bret Hart. These were collected in a book with other translated stories by Daudet, Tolstoy, Turgenev, 
Hucklander, Stern, and Kirchner. Mr. Mori wrote many books of criticism and translation, among which his translations of Faust and Goetz and his Life of Goethe are monumental works. Besides these, he has written many original poems, dramas, and stories. The stories included in this book are taken from some of his latest works. In my judgment, Takase Bune seems to reveal most of his qualities and merits. The subject was taken from the life of the 18th century, when Japan was under the iron rule of the so-called shogunate. The two figures, who are nothing but a humble criminal and a guard, are reflections of the clear minds of the age, as well as of the spirit of Japan, which partakes of centuries of thought. The plot is extremely simple. The characters are only two, depicted with the writer's tranquil, dignified, and tempered words, which somehow reminded Japanese readers of Flaubert or Merimee. Mr. Mori may not regard the other two stories as very important among his works, but they were so fresh and sweet to us that when we saw them in a magazine we felt as if we were looking at the white roses in the morning dew. It is the color of white that is characteristic of his writings. His treatment of Rodin may be a sort of tour de force, but still it has a vivid description of the character. I read it with a friend in the palm room of a restaurant at the riverside of Kyoto, with a glass of kale and a plate of fruits. We were delightfully surprised when Rodin asked about the mountain and the sea. There is a glimpse of Hiroshige's print, which is seen often in some corner of a European parlour, but so faint that the old blue colour passes almost unnoticed in the general tone of the marble white. In The Pier you will find the same reflection of the Japanese mind under a brighter sky in the character of a noble lady. How different she is from all your ladies of society! I cannot say which is better or which is happier, but the innermost sentiment does not seem to me to be different anywhere in the world. It is wonderful to consider the two, and to think of their difference in manners and customs. Compared with the hero of Takase Bune, you will find that the external development of Japan, its wealth and social ranks, has nothing to do with the moral sentiment of our people. That is what we are somehow proud of, and somehow ashamed of, at the same time. If the general tone of Mr. Mori's works is white, the color of Mr. Nagai Kafu is peacock blue, or it may be well to say crimson. He is essentially a colorist. His colors have become more somber with his maturity till we have such works as The Bill Collecting. Here you will find a maid-servant who is compelled to work for the class most humiliating at the present time in Japan. We see the sensitive feeling of her heart, like the Dewey Les Pedesa, as it is called in Japan, and the overflowing indignation of the writer at the sham respectability of society. It is written by the masterly hand of a social satirist. Is this a La Dame Camellia, who is speaking under the disguise of a Japanese maid? No, Mr. Nagai is a Japanese poet, all in all, but his attitude toward the world, his taste, and his early mode of writing often suggested the decadent literati at the end of the old feudal government. Spending most of his younger days in China, America, and in France, this character became submerged so deeply under the surface of his writings that when his two volumes of stories written in America and France were published, he appeared as a new star in the literary world of Japan. He watched the leaves falling in the Central Park. He sighed to see how soon the leaves of America are on the ground, for he is a poet in the real sense. How emotional he is before a thing of beauty may be noticed in his sketches of ukiyo-e, which I have included in this book. Mr. Shimazaki Tozon was first known as a lyric poet, and he was a successful poet too, for once there was none in Japan who was a peer with Mr. Shimazaki in the poetry of Dolce Stil Nuovo. At last the new days have come. 
he wrote triumphantly in the preface of the collection of his poems and it will be a long time before we forget the strain of nessun maggior dolore which came unconsciously from the mouth of our young poet with the russo-japanese war the literature of japan changed its whole aspect it was called the destruction of vision or the age of disillusion and was the proclamation of naturalism since then mr shimazaki has taken himself out of the poetical field and retired to the mountain in his native province we did not hear from him again till two or three years afterward when he returned to tokyo with a novel then he wrote several stories and novels but alas there was no more the poet of the alpine breeze his novel was compared with madame bovary and his stories with turgenev and maupassant but i think the critic who mentioned the pictures of millet was most clear-sighted one who knew his tendency in reality the two short stories which i include in this book will show this intimacy was the paramount thing he brought out in his writings intimacy with nature and intimacy with life which he tried to clothe with plain homespun realism but he did it so skilfully that even amid the current of crude naturalism he stood pre-eminently as an artist these writers i am glad to say are typical stylists of contemporary japanese literature their tendencies are different and tendencies of thought are always moving on reading these stories some critics will say that there is classicism in mr mori romanticism in mr nagai and naturalism in mr shimazaki if you will put neo before each ism it will be more accurate but what is the use it is always difficult to decide what tendency an author has shown in his works and it is often misleading to trace back the lineage of the minds of the east no matter what was their culture and what was their constitution of mind in the much questioned traditions of the west walter pater says that quote, in that house beautiful which the creative minds of all generations the artists and those who have treated life in the spirit of art are always building together for the refreshment of the human spirit these operations cease End quote. if you find a beauty in the lacquerware of korin or in the black and white of seshu here you will also find some beauties which are entirely proper to us japanese and which are also tending to the deeper current of humanity the title of the book polonia has a particular meaning to the japanese mind the word polonia is the name of a tree from which a lute of peculiar charm is made one which produces various sounds in this book are seven productions by three different authors all showing the melody of the japanese mind torao taketomo end of forward and introduction first story of polonia seven stories from contemporary japanese writers translated by torao taketomo this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by Hawaii in september two thousand fourteen takase bune by mori ogai takase bune is a small junk that goes up and down the river takase in kyoto during the tokugawa period when a criminal of kyoto was sentenced to banishment to a distant island the relatives of the criminal were called out to the prison house where they were allowed to bid him farewell then the criminal was taken to takasebune and was sent to osaka the man who took charge of him was a doshin or a private who was under the command of machibugyo the city magistrate of kyoto and it was the custom that this private permitted the chief among the relatives to go on the junk with the criminal this was not openly acknowledged by the government but was called looking over with generous eye or the tacit toleration though at that time the criminals who were sentenced to a distant island were considered as persons of great offence 
it was not that the majority of them were condemned with such ferocious rascal as the incendiaries or the murderers most of the criminals who went on board takasebune were people who did unintentional crimes by so-called misapprehension as an example there was a kind of criminal who committed suicide with his lover but remained alive after he killed his partner taking such criminals on board takasebune was rowed out when the sunset bells began to ring from the temples it ran toward the east facing the dark houses of kyoto on either shore and went down across the river kamo in this junk the criminal and his relatives talked over their lives through the night always the repetition of the same story of which the repentance is of no avail listening beside them the private who took the duty of the guard could know in detail the sad circumstances of the relatives and the family from which the criminal has come out this was the situation of which the judges who listened to the official statements or the court deliveries on the white sands of the city government or read the written statements on the desk of the office could never dream there were different characters among the persons who took the duty of the private some of them felt only annoyance and were so cold-hearted that they almost wanted to cover their ears while some others were deeply moved with the sorrows of other people which touched their hearts though they would not show their sympathy as they were doing their official duty sometimes when a criminal and his relatives with the most unhappy circumstances happened to be guarded by the private of especially tender and sympathetic heart this private could not help weeping with them therefore the guarding of takasebune was considered and disliked as the most unpleasant duty among the privates of the city government when was it perhaps it may have been during the age of kwanzai 1789 through 1800 when marquis shirakawa rakubo had ruling power at edo in a spring evening when as they say the cherry blossoms of the temple chio in fall in harmony with the sunset bells a strange criminal who had no similarity to any that had been seen till that time was taken to takasebune his name was kiske a man of about thirty years of age who had no settled abode as he had no relative to be called to the prison house he went on the junk all alone haneda shobe a private who was ordered to guard him and went on board with him had heard only that this kiske was guilty of the crime of fratricide now while he was escorting him from the prison-house to the pier he looked at the appearance of this thin pale-coloured kiske and found him quite frank and obedient respecting shobe as an officer of the government trying not to offend him in any point moreover these were not the flatteries to authority under the pretension of the mildness which were often perceived among the criminals shobe thought it strange and so after they went on board he paid minute attention to the actions of kiske more than his duty required that day the wind ceased to blow in the evening and a thin cloud that covered over the whole face of the sky blurred the outline of the moon it was an evening when the slow approaching warmth of summer was felt as if rising like a haze both from the earth on the shore and the river bed after they left the down quarter of the city of kyoto and passed across the river kamo the surroundings became so quiet that they only heard the lappings of the water cleaved by the prow though the criminal was allowed to sleep in the night boat kiske did not seem even to lie down but kept silent looking at the moon whose light was changing bright and dim according to the thickness of the cloud his forehead was cloudless and his eyes had a faint brightness though shobe was not looking straight at him he was constantly keeping his eyes on kiske repeating this is strange this is strange in his mind because the face of kiske looked so completely happy that he seemed even to begin to whistle or hum a song as if he was not afraid of annoying the officer shobe thought in himself 
he could not remember how often he had managed this takasebune but all the criminals whom he had taken on the junk had the same pitiful appearance that he could hardly bear to see the sight now what is the matter with this man he looks as if he is on the picnic boat it is said that he killed his brother and no matter how hateful a man the brother was and what the circumstances of his killing him he must be feeling badly if he has a human heart this pale coloured thin fellow is he such a peerless villain who is entirely lacking in that human sentiment he does not seem so is he haply insane no no his words and deportment do not show any such self-contradiction the more he thought of the attitude of kisuke it became more difficult for shobei to understand him becoming impatient shobei addressed him at last kisuke what are you thinking yes sir replied kisuke who looked around him and seemed to be afraid that he had done something offensive to the officer with quick apology he looked up to learn the humour of shobei shobei felt that he must make himself clear and apologise for the sudden question which had no concern to his official duty so he said thus nay i did not ask you with any special meaning in fact i wanted to ask you about your feeling in going to the island i have guarded a great many people in this junk and though they were men of various lives all were alike in lamenting their exile and wept through the night with the relative who looked after them and spent an evening in this junk but looking at your appearance i think you do not worry about going to the island what are you thinking of kisuke smiled and said i am so grateful for your kind words indeed it must be a sad thing for other people to go to the island i also sympathize with their feeling but that is only because they spent easy lives in the world no doubt that kyoto is a splendid place but even in that splendid place there will never again be such torment as i have experienced there the government was so merciful that it saved my life and ordered me to be sent to the island however sorrowful the island may be it cannot be the place where demons live i never have had the place where i could stay as my home but this time the government ordered me to make the island my home and allowed me to stay there without worry and this is the first thing that i am so thankful for moreover i have never fallen sick in spite of this feeble constitution so i think i never will hurt my body by exerting myself with any hard work in the island then as i was to be sent to the island i was given two hundred pennies which i have here thus speaking kisuke placed his hand on his breast it was the law at that time that a person who was sentenced to the banishment to the island was to be given two hundred pieces of copper kisuke continued his words i have to confess a shameful thing that i have never had the sum of two hundred pennies thus in my breast i sought to get work everywhere and worked very hard as soon as i got it and i had to deliver all the money i earned to another man's hand i was pretty well off if i could live from hand to mouth but mostly i paid my debts and borrowed again but since i was put into the prison house i was fed without doing any work i cannot help but feel grateful to the government for this single fact besides i was given this two hundred pennies if i could live on by things which will be given by the government i can keep these two hundred pennies without spending any of them this is the first time that i ever possessed the money which need not be spent though i do not know what kind of work i can do there until i land on the island i am looking forward with pleasure to use these two hundred pennies as a capital of the work which i do in the island after he said this kisuke became silent though shobei said hm is that it he also became silent for a while in deep meditation for everything he heard was quite far from his expectation shobei was aged almost to the beginning of the old age and had already four children by his wife 
and with his old mother his family consisted of seven members generally he was living such a frugal life that he was called a miser and he would not buy any clothes except the night clothings and those he wore at the office unfortunately however he took his wife from the family of a rich merchant and though the wife had good intentions to live upon his stipend she could not be economical enough to satisfy her husband because she had the habits of a spoiled child in a wealthy family frequently when the figures were wrong at the end of the month his wife borrowed the money secretly from her home for she knew that her husband hates the debt as the caterpillar after all this thing could not be hidden from a husband shobe who was annoyed even to receive the things from her home on such days as the five festivals or the clothes on the celebration of his children's coming of age did not like to hear that the cracks of his livelihood were filled up from her home this is the reason that the storms blew now and then in the home of haneda which otherwise had nothing to disturb its peace listening now to the story of kiske shobe compared the life of kiske to his own kiske said that he had to deliver from one hand to the other the money that he earned by his work which is really a sad and miserable condition but he reflected on his life how much distance there was between kiske and himself isn't he also one who is living only by the stipend from the government and delivering it from one hand to the other the difference between this and that is only the difference of the reeds on the abacus and he had no savings to correspond to the two hundred pennies which were so precious to kiske now considering the difference of the reeds it was reasonable that kiske was pleased with the coins of two hundred pennies regarding them as his savings the feeling could be sympathized with from shobei's side but no matter how great the difference between the reeds may be there was a more wonderful thing which was the unselfishness of kiske and his feeling of satisfaction kiske suffered when he could not find work in the world and when he had found it he worked hard and was easily contented by only getting enough to keep him from hunger since he was taken to the prison house he was surprised to see that the food which was so hard to get until that time was given without any labor like the bestowment from heaven and he felt a satisfaction which he never had experienced before here shobei found a greater difference beside that of the reeds between them though his livelihood which he was making by the stipend became sometimes short generally the expenditure and the receipt were regular it was life to the full extent of his power to comprehend it nevertheless he never felt the satisfaction in it generally he felt his life neither fortunate nor unfortunate in the deeper part of his mind however an apprehension was always lurking which made him think about what he should do if while thus living he were fallen into a serious illness or if he were suddenly dismissed from the office and this apprehension appeared in the field of his consciousness whenever he learned that his wife had borrowed money from her home to fill up the shortness of the expense why had this difference come to his attention looking from the outside he considered that it was only because kiske had no dependents while he shobe had some but this is not true supposing himself a single man shobe did not think that he could feel like kiske he thought that the reason must have a deeper cause vaguely shobe tried to think of a thing like the human life when one had an illness he thinks only if this illness was not in him when he had not his daily meal he thinks if he could only eat when he had no savings for some unforeseen accident he would think only of a small amount of money even then if he had some could he not have a little more thus from one desire to another man does not seem to stop no matter how far he goes he noticed that this kiske was the one who showed him that he must stop and look before him 
shobei looked at kisuke with renewed wonder and felt as if a halo was shining over the head of kisuke who was looking up to the sky gazing at the face of kisuke shobei addressed him again saying kisuke san this time he said son or mister but the appellation was not changed with full consciousness as soon as he heard his voice shobei noticed that this was not appropriate but he could not take back the word which was already spoken kisuke who replied yes sir seemed to wonder that he was called with son and looked timidly at shobei bearing his awkwardness shobei said i may be too inquisitive but i have heard that you were sentenced to be exiled to the island at present because you have killed a man will you mind to tell me the story kisuke said willingly sir with the appearance as if to plead his guilt and began to tell the story in a low voice i really have no word of apology for myself as i did such a dreadful thing under a great misapprehension thinking over it later i myself cannot understand why such a thing has happened it was really done in a rapture i lost my parents by pestilence when i was small and was left alone with my younger brother at first the people in our neighborhood pitied us and we grew up without being starved or frozen by doing some errands and such things for our neighbors even after we gradually aged when we searched after work we helped each other trying not to be separated as long as possible it was the autumn of the last year i and my brother were employed at a weaving establishment at nishijin doing a work which is called karabuki or the dryer meanwhile my brother has fallen sick so that he could not work any more at that time we were living in a place like a temporary barn at kitayama and were going to the weavers by crossing the bridge on the kamiya river when in the evening i came home with the food and the other things my brother was waiting for me and always said that he must not let me work alone one day i came home as usual without any anxiety and i found my brother lying on the bed with the face downward and there was blood all around him i was surprised and throwing off the bamboo sheath packages of food and other things i approached him saying what is the matter what is the matter then my brother lifted up his death-pale face which was dyed with blood from cheeks to chin and saw me but could not speak only a hissing sound came out from the wound each time he breathed as i could not understand this at all i tried to go nearer to him saying say what is the matter with you did you vomit the blood my brother raised up his body a bit sustained by his right hand on the bed and his left hand was clutching firmly a spot under the chin from which a clump of the dark blood was flowing between the fingers speaking to me with his eyes not to come nearer he opened his mouth at last he was able to speak some words pardon please he said as i thought this an incurable disease i decided to quicken my death to keep my brother a little of ease i thought i could die if i could cut the windpipe but only the breath came out i tried to thrust deeper deeper and it slipped aside it seems that the blade was not broken i may be able to die if you take this out it is so hard to speak help me please take it out when my brother loosened the hand the breath came out again from the wound my voice was choked so i could not speak and silently i looked at the throat of my brother it seemed to me that he had cut across the windpipe but as he could not die by that he had thrust the razor into the throat as if to gouge it i saw about two inches of the razor's handle thus far i looked but did not know what to do i only gazed at the face of my brother my brother was also gazing at me wait i said at last i will run for a doctor then my brother looked into my face with resentful eyes and clutching again the throat firmly with his left hand he said what can the doctor do 
ah it is painful quick take it out i entreat you feeling at a loss i was still looking at the face of my brother it is strange that the eyes speak in such a time my brother's eyes urged do it quick quick gazing at me with such a resentful look i felt that the inside of my head was turning around like a wheel but the eyes of my brother did not cease that dreadful urging moreover the resentfulness of his eyes grew sharper and sharper until they became such fierce eyes as those that glare at the face of an enemy looking at this i felt that i must do as he asked and i said it cannot be helped i will take it out instantly the expression of my brother's eyes changed and he looked so serene and happy i thought i must do it in one movement so i bent my body forward just as i was kneeling my brother let go his right hand with which he was sustaining himself and helped by the hand which had clutched the throat firmly i caught the handle of the razor and drew it out just at that moment i saw opening the front door which i closed from the inside an old woman entering the house she was the old woman whom i employed to attend to my brother while i am away to help him to drink medicine and to do other such things as it was already dark in the house i do not know how much she had seen there crying alas she ran out leaving the door opened when i drew out the razor i took care to draw it quickly and straightly but the unsteadiness of my hand was such that i cut some part which was not cut before as the blade was facing to the outside it may have been that a part on that side was cut with razor clasped in my hand vacantly i was looking at the old woman coming in and running out it was after she went away that i was awakened to myself and looked at my brother who was already dead a great deal of blood was flowing from the wound thus i remained gazing with the razor beside me at the face of my brother dead with half-opened eyes until the senators of the town came and took me to the office when he had said this kisuke who told his story looking up to shobei's face dropped his eyes the story of kisuke was quite logical it may be almost well to say that it was too logical this came about because he had reflected on the affair many times during about half a year and because he had to rehearse it each time when he was required at the city office or before the court of the government listening to him shobei felt as if he was looking at the very scene but when the story was half told a doubt was raised in his mind was this really a fratricide he could not answer the question even when he heard all of the story the brother had asked him to draw out the razor because he thought that he would be able to die if it was drawn so he drew it and let him die which may be considered as a murder but it seemed to shobei that the brother had to die even if he was left in that condition the reason that he wanted to die sooner was that he could not bear the anguish kisuke could not bear to see it and intending to save him from that anguish he cut short the life of his brother is this a crime undoubtedly the fact that he killed him is a crime but the doubt came here where shobei thought that it was done to save anguish he could not solve it by any means after much reflection there came into shobei's mind a desire to put the burden upon someone who was superior to him it was the desire to follow authority shobei too wished to make the judgment of the honorable magistrate like his own but even when he desired this there was something in his mind which he could not understand but somehow he wanted to ask the honorable magistrate about it in the gloomy night that declined hour after hour takasebune loaded with two silent men glided along upon the surface of the dark water end of the first story
second story of polonia seven stories from contemporary japanese writers translated by torao taketomo this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by abai in september two thousand fourteen hanako by mori ogai auguste rodin came into the studio the spacious room was filled with sunshine this hotel biron was a luxurious building originally erected by a certain rich man but later on it became a convent of the school of the sacred heart and remained so until a short time ago perhaps in this very room the nuns of the sacre coeur called together the girls of the faubourg saint germain and taught them their hymns just as the little birds cry out on seeing from their nest the mother approaching so the little girls standing in rows and opening their mouths may have sung those cheerful voices no longer may be heard but another sort of cheerfulness is reigning in this room a different life is dominating it is a voiceless life but though voiceless it is magnificent pulsating and cultured there were several lumps of gypsum on each of several tables the master is accustomed to begin several works at a time and to work on them intermittently according to his mood until complete as various plants bloom at the same time so certain of his works grow like things in nature some rapidly some slowly this man has a tremendous perception of form his works are growing before his hands touch them this man has a tremendous power of concentration the moment he begins a work he is able to assume the attitude of continuing a work begun some hours before with bright face rodin looked over the numerous half-completed works that face with a broad forehead a nose that seemed to have a joint in the middle a white ample beard that crowded about the chin there were knocks at the door entrez a deep powerful voice unlike that of an old man vibrated through the air of the room the man who entered the door was a lean fellow of about thirty years of age with dark brown hair and a jewish cast of countenance he announced that he was bringing mademoiselle hanako as he had promised Rodin did not change his appearance either when he saw the man entering or when he heard the words. Once, when a chieftain from Cambodia was staying in Paris, Rodin saw a dancer whom this chieftain had brought, and he felt a kind of attraction for the flexible movements of her long slender limbs. The dessins taken in haste are still in his possession. Rodin believing as in that case that every person has something of beauty a beauty to one who discovers the point had heard that a japanese girl called hanako had been on the stage at the varieté for several days through a mediator he asked the man who had charge of hanako to bring her to his house the man who had come was the manager the impresario let her come hither rodin said it was not merely from lack of time that he neglected to show him to a chair i have brought an interpreter with us the man said as if to learn his humour who is he is he a frenchman no a japanese who works at l'institut pasteur he heard from hanako that she was called to you and desired to come as interpreter all right let him enter also instantly two japanese a man and a woman entered the room both of them looked peculiarly small the manager who followed and closed the door was not a tall man but the two japanese reached only to his ears rodin's face wrinkled about the eyes the wrinkles which seem to be carved at the inner corner when he looks at things intently the wrinkles showed at this time his gaze moved from the student to hanako and stayed there for a while the student saluted and grasped the right hand rodin offered the hand on which each sinew stood on the surface the hand that had created la danaide le baiser and le penseur 
and taking out a card on which kubota m p was written he delivered it to rodin rodin glanced at the card and said are you working at l'institut pasteur yes sir have you been there for some time avez-vous bien travaillé kubota was surprised he had been told that rodin says this as a habit now these simple words were spoken directly to him oui beaucoup monsieur at the moment he said this kubota felt as if he were swearing to be diligent for life kubota introduced hanako rodin looked down as if to comprehend her with a glance of the eye and he saw the small trim body of hanako from the unbecomingly dressed hair of takashimada to the tips of her feet in white tabi and in chiyoda sandals and he reached forth and took the tiny but robust hand kubota could not but feel in his mind a sort of humility he wished that he had a finer person to introduce to rodin as a japanese woman his feeling was not unreasonable for hanako was not a beauty she had appeared in the european cities as a japanese actress but the japanese themselves knew nothing of such an actress of course kubota also knew nothing about her moreover the actress was not a beauty it might be too severe to call her a servant she did not seem to have worked especially hard for her hands and feet were not hardened but even at her bloom of seventeen her appearance would hardly rank her as a chambermaid in a word she was not more presentable than a nursery maid unexpectedly rodin's face showed a glow of satisfaction he was pleased with hanako healthy with no sign of indulgence in leisure with firm elastic flesh well developed by proper exercise characteristics that were vividly shown in the face short from forehead to chin in the bare wrists and gloveless hands and in the thin skin which showed not a particle of fat hanako who was already accustomed to european manners took the hand of rodin with an amiable smile on her face rodin offered chairs to both of them and said to the manager please wait for us a while in the parlor after the manager was gone they sat down offering the uncovered box of cigars to kubota rodin said to hanako are there any mountains or sea at mademoiselle's home hanako as is common among the women in such a profession had a regular stereotyped story of her life which she told to persons whenever she was questioned just as in the case of the little girl in zola's lourdes who relates the miracle of the recovery of her injured feet in the train her story became through frequent repetition like the composition of the routine story-teller fortunately the unexpected question of rodin upset this ready-made plan the mountain is at a distance the sea is close by the answer pleased rodin did you ride on junks frequently yes sir did you row yourself no sir i did not row as i was still small my father rowed a picture came into rodin's imagination and he became silent for a while rodin is a man who is often silent rodin said abruptly to kubota i presume mademoiselle is acquainted with my profession would she be willing to remove her clothing kubota reflected a moment of course he did not wish to be instrumental in causing a woman of his own country to bear herself before another man but he did not object to daring it for rodin there was no need on his part for reflection his hesitation was due to the doubt as to what hanako would say anyway i will speak to her if you please kubota addressed hanako in this manner the master has something to consult you about i think you understand that he is the peerless sculptor of the world and models the shape of the human body this is the point about which he wishes to consult you he wishes to know if you will oblige him by posing to him in the nude for a few moments what do you say as you see he is an elderly man not far from seventy 
Moreover, he is such a fine gentleman. What do you think? Thus saying, Kubota looked attentively into Hanako's face. He was wondering whether she would be overcome with shame or affect airs or blame him. I will, she replied frankly and naively. She consents, Kubota told Rodin. Rodin's face shone with pleasure, and rising up from the chair, he took out paper and chalk, and said to Kubota as he laid them on the table, Will you stay here? The same thing is sometimes necessary in my profession, said Kubota, but it might be unpleasant to mademoiselle. Then will you wait there in the library? I shall be through within fifteen or twenty minutes. Light a cigar, if you like. He says he will be through within fifteen or twenty minutes. Saying these words to Hanako, Kubota went out through the door shown him. The small chamber into which Kubota stepped had entrances on either side and only one window. Bookcases were on the wall opposite the window and on the other walls that constituted its wings. Kubota stood a while, reading the titles on the leather bindings of the books. This was a collection which had been assembled rather by chance than by intention. Rodin was by nature a book-lover, and it is said that he was always carrying a book in his hand even in his young days of misery when he was roaming the streets of Brussels. Among the old dusty books there must be some of varied memories, and brought here with purpose. As the ashes of his cigar were about to fall, Kubota walked toward the table and dropped the ashes in the receiver. And, wondering what were the books on the table, he took them up to see. On the furthest edge of the table, leaning against the window, was a book which Kubota took to be a Bible, but, on opening it, he found that it was the Edition de Poche of the Divina Commedia. The book aslant was one of the works of Baudelaire. Without any idea of reading, he opened the first page, on which there was a treatise entitled The Metaphysics of the Toy, and, wondering what was in it, he all at once began to read. The treatise opened with this memory, that when Baudelaire was a little boy he was taken to a certain demoiselle who had a room full of toys and told he might have his choice. After a child has played with a toy for a while, he is possessed to break it. He wonders what there is beyond the thing. If it be a moving toy, he wishes to search after the origin of the impulse. Hence the child goes from physique to metaphysique, from science to metaphysics. As it was only four or five pages, Kubota, becoming interested, read through to the end. Then there was a knock. The door opened and Rodin's white-haired head peeped through. Pardon me, you must be tired. No, sir, I was reading Baudelaire. Saying thus, Kubota entered the studio. Hanako was already dressed. Two esquisses were lying on the table. What of Baudelaire were you reading? The metaphysics of the toy. The same idea pertains to the human body, that the form is not interesting simply because it is a form. It is a mirror of the soul. The inner flame showing transparently through the form alone is interesting. When Kubota looked timidly at the esquisse, Rodin said, They must be hard to understand, as they are so rough. He continued after a moment. Mademoiselle has an exceedingly beautiful body. She has not a particle of fat. Each muscle arises on the surface like the muscle of a fox terrier. As the fibers are tight and thick, the size of the joints is made the same as the size of the limbs. They are so firm that she could stand on one leg while the other is stretched at the right angle, like a tree that has its roots thrust deep in the earth. This is different from the Mediterranean type with broad shoulders and loins, and does not resemble the North European type with broad loins but narrow shoulders. It is the beauty of strength. End of the second story Third story of 
Polonia, Seven Stories from Contemporary Japanese Writers. Translated by Torao Taketomo. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Abai in September 2014. The Pier by Mori Ogai. The pier is long, long. The rails of four railroads cut straight and obliquely the beams of the iron bridge on which the long and short cross beams are like the bars of a xylophone on which children play. Through the cracks of the cross beams that almost catch the heels of shoes and wooden clogs, here and there the black waves are shown, reflected on the white flashes of sunshine. The sky has cleared into a deep blue. On the inside of the train, where she was sitting with her husband starting today, she did not think the wind was blowing. When leaving the Jinrikisha, in which she rode from the station of Yokohama, and standing on this pier, she found that the wind of the 5th of March was still blowing as if to bite the skin, fluttering the skirts of the Azuma coat. It is the Azuma coat in silver grey, which she loosely wears on her body, that carries the child of her husband, who is starting today, this day which is not far from the month of confinement. She came with her hair in Sokuhatsu. Her boa is of white ostrich. Holding the light green umbrella with tassels, she walks along, surrounded by four or five maidservants. The pier is long, long. The big ships are anchoring on the right and the left of the pier. Some are painted in black, some in white. The anchored ships are making a fence for the wind. Every time she leaves the place where there are ships, a gust of wind blows and flutters the skirts of her Azuma coat. Two years ago, immediately after he was graduated from the University of Literature, the Count, her husband, had married her. It was during the previous year that she gave birth to her first child, a princess like a jewel. At the end of the year the husband became a master of ceremonies at the court. And now he is starting to London, charged with his official duty. In his newly made grey overcoat, flinging the cane with crooked handle, her husband is walking rapidly along the pier. The Viscount, who is going with him, and whose height is taller by a head than his, also walks rapidly beside him, clad in a suit of similar colour. The French ship, on which her husband is about to go abroad, is anchoring at the extreme end of the right side of the pier. A stool, like that which is used to repair the wires of a trolley, is stationed on the pier, and from it a gangplank is laid across to the bulwark. While walking slowly she sees her husband and the Viscount, his companion, crossing the gangplank and entering the ship. The group of people looking after them are standing, here and there, on the pier. Almost all of them are those who came to bid adieu to her husband and the Viscount. Perhaps there are no other passengers on this ship about to sail who are so important and are looked at by so many people. Some of them are going to the foot of the stool on which the gangplank is laid and stop there to wait for their companions. Some of them are standing at the place, a bit before the stool, where the blocks and ropes are laid down. Among these people there must be some who are intimately known to her husband, and some who know him but slightly. But, standing under this clear sky, they all seem dejected, or is it only her fancy? The pier is long, long. Following slowly after them, unconsciously she looks off to her right, where there were many round windows on the side of the ship. The faces and chests of women are seen from one of those round windows. Three of them are from thirty to forty years of age, all with white aprons on their chests. They must be the waitresses of the ship. 
supposing them to be the waitresses who wait on the passengers of the ship on which her husband is on board she feels envious of even those humble women there is also a woman at the bulwark looking down on the pier who wears a big bonnet with white cloth and carries a small leather bag in her hand two big eyes as if painted with shadows are shining on her wrinkled face above the large nose like a hook she looks like a jewess she also must be a traveller who is going on this ship she is also envious of her the pier is long long at last she arrives at the foot of the gangplank cautiously she carries her body which has the second infant of her husband under the azuma coat and descends on the deck of the big black painted ship she hands the umbrella to a maid-servant led by the people who have come to say farewell and were already on board she goes back along the bulwark toward the prow there are rooms for passengers at the end of the way the numbers of which increase from twenty-seven to twenty-nine the viscount is standing at the entrance and addresses her this is the room madam peeping into the room she finds two beds under which the familiar packages and trunks are deposited her husband is standing before one of the beds look it through madam it is like this this is the room she must look through it carefully during the long long voyage of her husband this is the room where her dreams must come and go a man who looks like the captain comes and addressing her husband in french guides him to the saloon of the ship she follows her husband and the viscount and enters the room this is a spacious and beautiful saloon several tables are arranged each bearing a flower basket gradually the people who came to say farewell gather into the room by the order of this man who looks like the captain a waiter brings forth many cups in the shape of morning glories and pouring champagne into them he distributes them among the people another waiter brings cakes like those which are brought with ice cream piled on a plate in the form of the well crib and distributes them among the people the people who received the cups go one after another and stand before her husband and the viscount wishing them a happy voyage and drink from the cups sitting on a small chair beside the table she is waiting for the time when the congratulations are at the end during his busy moments now and then her husband lifts his eyes to her however there is no more to be said to her before many people also there is no more to be said to him before many people the bell rings having bidden farewell to her husband and to the viscount the people are going out one after another she also follows them saluting her husband and the viscount again crossing the dangerous gangplank she descends to the pier she received the light green umbrella from the hand of her maid-servant and raises it her husband and the viscount are standing on the bulwark looking in her direction she is looking up at them from under her umbrella she feels that her eyes as she looks up are growing gradually larger and larger again the bell rings a few french sailors begin to untie the rope from the gangplank a japanese laborer in hanten is standing on the stool like that which is used in repairing the trolley preparing to draw down the gangplank hanging on the rope of the wheel pulled by the man in hanten the gangplank at last leaves the bulwark the noon gun of the city of yokohama resounds with this as a signal the ship from the hold of which for some time a noise has been issuing silently begins to move the elderly europeans who seem to be a married couple are standing at the bulwark they are talking about something of a jolly nature with a white-haired old man who is standing on the pier with one of his feet placed on an apparatus to roll the ropes which looks like a big bobbin they do not seem to regret the parting 
it looks as if the ship is moving it looks as if the pier is moving there seems to be the distance of a parallax between the place where her husband and the viscount are standing and the place where she is standing she feels her eyes growing larger and larger some of the people who are looking after them are running to the end of the pier she cannot do such an immodest thing suddenly something white waves at the bulwark it was a handkerchief waved by the hand of a woman who wears a big bonnet decorated with a white cloth a tall man stands at the end of the pier in red waistcoat and tan shoes a white handkerchief waves also from the hand of this man this also must be a parting in human life these two persons set the fashion and the handkerchiefs are waved here and there white things are waving also from the people who are looking after the group surrounding the count she also grasps the batiste handkerchief which she has brought in her sleeve but she cannot do such an immodest thing when the ship seemed to have left the pier it turned its prow a bit to the right the place where her husband and the viscount were standing has disappeared at last still she can see a boy about fifteen or sixteen standing at the stern in a blue cold-looking garment like a blouse what mother is waiting for him in france or has he no parents what is he looking at standing by the rail at the stern slowly she turned her feet and walked among the maid-servants surrounding her the pier is long long at the place where the black painted ship was anchored until a short time ago the water is glittering like the scales of fish as the small ripples are reflecting the pale sunshine end of the third story fourth story of polonia seven stories from contemporary japanese writers translated by torao taketomo this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Abai in October 2014. The Bill Collecting by Nagai Kafu. 1. Instantly after she got up from the bed where she was sleeping with Omatsu, her companion, Oyo put on her narrow sleeved hanten as usual and wrapping her head with a towel in the manner of the sister's cap she began to sweep the parlour oyo is the maid-servant in kinugawa an assignation house as they had guests in the inner room of yojohan who had been lodging there since the evening before oyo wiped up every place with the dust cloth except that room including the railings and stairways of the first floor coming down to the fireplace near the counter she found the mistress with toothbrush in her mouth already uncovering the charcoal fire of the previous evening in contrast to the dark humid interior where the odour of wine seemed to drift from somewhere the winter sunshine glittering on the opposite side of the street and through the frosted glass screen of the front lattice gate looked quite warm and cheerful as soon as the mistress saw oyo who was bidding her good morning she said all at once now oyo i wish you would go directly after breakfast as the place is far being thus ordered oyo took up her chopsticks for breakfast eating before omatsu and otetsu the cook after having finished her toilet and changed her dress and listening again to the instructions and messages from the mistress she started it was almost seven o'clock when she set out in the new wooden clogs that were given her by the regular geisha girls as a present at the end of the last year and she heard the voice of the cook supplier at the kitchen the man who came to get the plates and bowls oyo went out by the familiar shortcut through the lane between the houses of the geisha girls coming out into the open street of ginza which was filled with sunshine she looked around her as though surprised at the new appearance of things 
her bosom pulsated to the sounds of trolleys passing by and she not only felt that she had forgotten all the messages charged by the mistress but even the route which she thought she had understood well when she left home she became confused so that the way seemed further than she had supposed it had been five years since oyo entered service in the autumn at the age of fourteen at kinugawa the assignation house she had been at hakone and at enoshima she knew haneda and the shrine of narita but it was only as an attendant of the guests and geisha girls in the great carousels of many people that she went to these places once though she was a woman she had walked alone through the night with two or three hundred yen in cash in her sash but it was not further than a few blocks where she went to an accustomed bank on behalf of the mistress it was only once or twice in a year that she rode a really long distance by trolley to visit her home at minami senju for holiday to a woman of downtown who knows nothing about the suburbs of tokyo except fukagawa shinagawa and asakusa even to hear the name of okubo in the uptown district where oyo was going to-day to collect the bill caused her to imagine a place where foxes and badgers live as she also felt fearful that she might not be able to return home that day if she did not catch the trolley as soon as possible she hurried to the square of owaricho not even stopping at the beautiful show window of matsuya and makamiya and tenshodo good morning maid oyo suddenly being thus addressed from the crowd which was waiting for the trolley oyo turned back and saw an employed girl of tamaomiya who had her hair dressed in hisashigami and wore the half-coat of koki silk kimi-chan going to temple as is a habit of woman oyo looked at the hair and clothing of this geisha girl which was not particularly unusual no i have a patient at home kimi chan the employed girl said apologetically as though answering the question of the employer where are you going to the place called okubo i was told to take the shinjuku line is this the place to wait for it shinjuku then it is on the other side you must take the car from the other side of the street oh oyo cried with such a loud voice that she surprised herself and as if she could not hear the formal salutation of the employed girl please keep me in mind again she crossed the square to the other side almost in rapture though it was a winter morning her forehead perspired having heaved a sigh of relief before the glass door of the cafe lyon oyo turned back with a wonder-stricken look to the other side of the street where was the clock on the roof of the hattori clock store thinking that it was a marvellous thing that she was not killed in the midst of the square where so many trolleys are crossing by that time the employed girl of tamaomiya almost crushed among the crowds on the conductor's platform went away toward the mihara bridge and though many almost empty cars followed it the only thing that passed the tracks where oyo was waiting was a lumbering horse truck loaded with casks the sidewalk near to the cafe lyon was so filled with persons waiting for transfers that they overflowed on to the street pavement unconsciously oyo looked at the blue sky of winter calling to mind the clock on the roof of hattori's building which pointed to half-past eleven she became so impatient that she felt she could not wait any longer the complaints of the persons who were waiting for transfers speaking in loud voices the breaking of the wires or the stoppage of the electric current disturbed her as though it were the announcement of a fire burning her house exhausted by waiting oyo like the others leaned against the glass door of the cafe and hung her head suddenly becoming conscious of a commotion oyo also ran in order not to be too late for the car but being only a helpless woman she could hardly approach the first car even the next one she missed for a big man of dark complexion crossing in from the side had pushed her away when her foot was already on the step moreover her side lock of ichogaishi was rubbed up by the sleeve of the double manteau with great force now i won't mind what becomes of me 
I will wait even half a day, or a day, as long as they want me to wait. Oyo, who had already become desperate, purposely followed behind the crowd to take the next approaching car. When they came to Hibiya Park, a seat was left, so Oyo could at last rest her tired back. Then the inside of the car was calmer, and the streets outside opened out and became more quiet, and in the warmth of the inside of the car, with the sun shining on the back of her neck and shoulders, she nodded involuntarily with the light jolting of the car. The fatigue of the body, which has to work every night until one o'clock at the earliest, pressed on her eyelids all at once. As Oyo is the favorite servant of the mistress, raised by her from childhood, she must help her not only in the parlor of the guests, but also as chambermaid. To be made a companion in the late drinking of the guest in her busy time is bearable, but the most disgusting thing is the troublesome task of washing clean, in a hot water cup, the whole set of artificial teeth of a guest nearly sixty years of age, every time after his meal. In a short time there were indications of the stopping of the car and passengers coming and going. Oyo awakened all at once, surprised, and looked out of the window. She saw a leafy tree, a high bank, and a low bridge on the waterless moat. The conductors, enough to frighten her, were assembled in front of the new house at the corner. Many empty cars were left as if they were to be given away. With this sight of unfamiliar streets, Oyo felt unutterable helplessness. She became anxious about the thing in her sash, fearing that it had been stolen in her absent-minded moments. Also she doubted whether this was the place to leave the car. Impatiently she moved a bit from the end and said, Please, what is this place? The high-boned, flat-faced, slant-eyed conductor, who seemed to perceive the embarrassed figure of Oyo by a glance, did not move from the platform. Shrugging his shoulders, as if cold, and turning his head to the other side, he pulled the bell so that Oyo, who had left her seat, was upset by the moving car and thrown with all the weight of her body on the lap of a man looking like a foreman of the laborers who was sitting near to the entrance. Feeling abashed, Oyo tried to get up quickly. She noticed that a big arm, as heavy as iron, was laid on her back, as if to embrace her body. She struggled with all her might. Eh 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 with the vile frightful laughter there was a smell of wine how can i stand it when i am held fast by a girl what good luck to have chanted one of the group that was sitting on the other side and they burst into laughter oyo flushed like fire and wished even to jump out of the moving car after that she felt that all the eyes in the car were looking constantly at her even then she had not gained her composure after the fright of the moment when she felt herself closely embraced by a laborer. All at once Oyo became conscious that no one in the car was dressed like her, in maize and silk with folds laid somewhat loose, grey haori with an embroidered crest on it, and an apron of itori neatly tied. All the other women were in hisashigami and in close folds, and most of the men passengers were soldiers. Her helplessness riding among these unknown people became more keen. Just at the time when she was about to ask the conductor, who came to inspect the transfer tickets regarding the station before Shinjuku, her embarrassment and helplessness became all but overwhelming. This is the Aoyama line, miss. If you wish to go to Shinjuku, there is no other way but to transfer at Aoyama Ichome, and again at Shiocho. Throwing the transfer ticket on the lap of Oyo, the conductor hurried to fix the dislocated pole. As she had understood that she could go all the way without transferring, Oyo, on hearing that she had to transfer not once but twice, felt as if she was thrown at last into the labyrinthic jungle of Yawata. Two. After going here and there, Oyo was able at last to realize that Tenmacho Nichome was the station before Shinjuku. How far would the troubles of the unknown route continue? 
oyo regretted that she had come and thought that she would never again go on an errand to an unknown place no matter how she might be scolded it is far better to stay at home with the sweeping and to dry the bedclothes or to wash the yukata to offer to the guests in this broad street more bustling than she could have expected she could not tell whether she had to turn to the right or to the left nevertheless as she could not stand in the middle of the street she was thinking about paying her own money secretly to ride in a kuruma when she saw a kurumaya from the stand and asked him how much she would have to pay to ride to okubo give me fifty sen don't fool me being much provoked oyo did not even turn to the kurumaya who called out something to her from her back and walked aimlessly to a side street seeing a little girl with tucks at her shoulders in front of a tobacco shop she asked in an almost weeping tone please my girl will you kindly let me know how to get to yochomachi of okubo yochomachi said the girl cheerfully go straight this way and going down a slope you will find a policeman's post you had better ask at the policeman's post oyo felt revived for the first time thank you ever so much putting an overwhelming sentiment of thanks into these simple words oyo walked away looking curiously at the sights on both street of the somewhat narrow street there was a european building for moving pictures on one side from the lane near to the building a few geisha girls came out laughing about something in loud voices looking at them oyo wondered why are there geisha girls in such a place suddenly she heard a tremendous noise before she could think what was the matter she saw many soldiers on horseback riding from the open street to this narrow side street there was the gate of a temple at one side of the beginning of the slope and taking advantage of an open place oyo was fortunate enough to get out of the way she saw six or seven men employed on the telegraph wires squatting on the earth eating their luncheon a bamboo ladder was leaned against a wire pole on the other side of the street hello the beauty their teasing started oyo running away in embarrassment we are receiving an extraordinary benten hey my girl may i offer you a glass some of them were looking intently at the folds of her skirts they could not contain themselves any longer when a sudden wind had brushed aside the skirts of her underclothes all of them burst in at once luck to see <gasps> it is worth two yen at shinjuku the red clothes are said to keep long and they continued to say things which were unbearable to hear but is not the procession of the soldiers endless stirring up the sand on all sides and how much oyo wished to escape oyo finally got away from the place and went down the slope almost running when she suddenly stumbled on a stone and hardly kept from falling in front of it she saw something that looked like a squirming heap of rags which said ladies and gentlemen passing by please a penny two or three leper beggars at whom one could not bear to look a second time were making bows on the sand of the street the town at the foot of the slope was visible with the dirty roofs in confusion at the bottom of the valley like lowland oyo wondered without any reason whether the town over yonder was the outcasts quarter going down the slope and turning to the left as she was instructed by the girl of the tobacco shop she easily found a policeman's post as a policeman who looked good-natured was standing in the middle of the street she asked him her route what number of yochomachi is it it is number sixty two the house is mr inuyama's number sixty two then you have to go straight along this way and go up the slope before a big wine shop i see and let me see is it the third side street after you go straight up the slope you turn there to the left where you will find number sixty two much obliged to you 
Before she had gone less than half a block, she found a wine shop that looked like the one she was told about, and also a slope, so she thought the rest of the route was quite short. Feeling somewhat proud that she had come this far alone without the kuruma or without going much out of the way, she forgot a while even the fatigue of her legs, but when she began to go up the slope she had to meet another unexpected trouble. Though the downtown district had had such continuous clear weather that it was annoyed by the dust, the uptown quarter of the city seemed to have had rain the night before, and the street, which was not broad, was so deep in mud that Oyo could not even find the sidewalk. By the time she discovered that the mud was melting frost, which had not had time to dry, not only the toes of her new wooden clogs, but also her white socks newly washed, were all splashed with mud. On one side of the road was the bank covered with sepiaria, and on the other side was a cryptomeria hedge, where, taking advantage of the fact that there were no passers-by, Oyo took out her pocket papers and wiped, she knew not how often, the mud from the mat lining of her wooden clogs. As she glanced up, she thought the third side street to which she had been directed by the policeman might be the corner she sought. 3. The mud of the melting frost became harder and harder. A big, masterless dog was roaming about with a menacing look. The rasping sounds of a violin were heard. The dreary sigh of the wind came from the trees nearby. Far at the end of the side street the ground seemed to slope again, and, though the winter sunshine was falling gently on the roofs of the new houses, and on the deep forest that covered the rears of all the houses, either side of the road was dark in shade, and all the houses were surrounded with fences of four-inch boards. Each had a small gate containing a slight door, the faces of which were smeared with mud that had not been washed off, which seemed to have been placed there in mischief by the boys in the neighborhood. The number and name of the house, which Oyo found at last, after examining all the labels on the houses on both sides, was on the support of the small gate, where the mud was splashed thickest and dirtiest. Inuyama Takemasa Oyo looked at it again before she entered the gate. The gentleman called Mr. Inuyama was the most captious, unsympathetic, and unreasonable among the numerous guests that came to Kinugawa. No matter how busy they were in attendance in the parlors, he would not be satisfied if he could not call up Oyo and all the other maids into his room. If the mistress did not come to salute him every time he came, he would be angry and say, you insult me, or you treat me coldly. It was said that he gave up his membership in the parliament as it did not suit his dignity. His profession at present was that of a politician. He was fond of geishas as young as babies, and if the girls did not obey his will, he was so furious that nobody could touch him, and Oyo not only despised him more than any of the other guests, but also was afraid, without any reason, of his forbidding appearance and loud voice. He always wore European clothes, and used to come in a kuruma pulled by two drawers, saying that the lower class of people ride in a trolley. Once in a certain conversation, when the mistress had said to him that, in these days not only the expenses of your pleasure and the tips for geisha become dearer, but even your expense for kuruma must be very considerable. He laughed. Mistress, the money is earned to spend. <laughs> but these prosperous days were no longer. When it was hardly December of that year, Mr. Inuyama suddenly stopped coming, and in spite of many letters he would not respond to the bill of two hundred yen of that month, and the fifty yen balance of the previous month. Kinugawa was obliged to talk it over with the geisha, who first brought Mr. Inuyama after their meeting at a certain Matsumotoro, but it was almost clear that she could not shake her sleeve when she had none, and so January passed in this way, and now it was February. The mistress sent Oyo to the mansion of Mr. Inuyama to reconnoitre. 
Oyo had known numerous cases of this kind, not only of men like Mr. Inuyama, but also of many other guests. She thought this nothing more than the bad ways of people. She thought only that they will be enjoying themselves at some other house if they do not come to hers. Then it will be good of them if they will be more considerate and pay the bill. The reason Oyo looked again at the label on the gate was the fact that the gate of his mansion was so dirty. But to enter the gate was better than the annoyance of walking around aimlessly any longer in the frost-melting road, so she looked around from the porch with its dirty and broken paper screen, wondering which was the servant's entrance. On the right hand, beyond the bamboo fence, was visible the roof of a one-storied house looking cold under the garden trees. She got a glimpse of an old red blanket and a dirty cotton gown hung on a clothes pole through the crevices of the bamboo fence. On the left hand, further on, were one-storied houses with lattice gates, and another that looked like a rented house. Beside the wheel well, where the plum blossoms showed their buds, a fishmonger was cutting a salted salmon. Two maidservants in careless hisashigami, who carried babies under quilted gowns and wore European aprons which had become grey, seemed to be at the height of their silly conversation with the fishmonger. As soon as they caught sight of Oyo, whose appearance was quite different, they sharpened their eyes and, seeming rather to fear her, looked her over attentively from top to toe. The road from the well to the servant's entrance was spread with straw bags of charcoal, and the muddy water of the melting frost ran into the feet of people walking on them. Being in much perplexity, Oyo could not move a step, and, bending her waist, said, "'I beg your pardon.' Both of the maidservants stood wonder-stricken with open mouths. "'Is this Mr. Inuyama's house?' Suddenly one of the maid-servants began to grow uneasy, and, perceiving her manner, Oyo said, I came with a message from Kyobashi. Is the master at home? He is absent. Then the baby on her back began to cry. Oyo, as she was ordered by the mistress, remembered how to proceed when she was told the master was absent, namely, to call madam to the servant's entrance and leave the word that she was the messenger from Mizuta, which was the name of her mistress. However, as Oyo was only eighteen or nineteen, she felt somewhat timid and stood on the walk, forgetting even that the water of the melting frost was overflowing on her polished wooden clogs. The baby on the back of the maid-servant cried more and more. Chiyo! Chiyo! Suddenly a voice of woman close to her ears aroused her. Being astonished, Oyo turned and saw at the broken paper screens of the servant's entrance, not farther than six inches, the big face of a woman, like a horse, with the eyes widely separated from each other. The careless Hisashigami could not be beaten by the maid-servants. She was a big, clumsy madam in a dirty and creased hifu. Just then the fishmonger came to offer three slices of the salted salmon to madam. Madam continued talking with the fishmonger, and Oyo, at last somewhat aroused and feeling at the same time a sense of deep disappointment, went out from the gate as if to escape for she felt that her troubles in coming so far had been all in vain. She was exceedingly sorry for her mistress, as she had been entirely deceived by this humbug. When Oyo rode again in the trolley, she felt, at first, the fatigue of the vain effort, and at the same time the fact that she was unbearably hungry, but being unable to do anything about it, she arrived at Ginza. The sun was already declining. Calling to her mind the clock-stand of Hattori, which she saw when she was waiting for the car that morning, she looked up, and, lo, was it not already near to four o'clock? Oyo felt her heart sinking with melancholy, picturing in her mind the flash of her mistress's eye, who never would say to her, How early you are, when she returned from the far-away errand. The electric lights were already lit in the shops. End of the fourth story.
fifth story of polonia seven stories from contemporary japanese writers translated by torao taketomo this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by abai in october two thousand fourteen ukiyoe by nagai kafu the following sketches were written on seeing a collection of famous prints which were exhibited at the imperial museum during the month of april in the forty-fourth year of meiji nineteen eleven the woman of utamaro what a languid sweetness what a dreamy pensiveness the woman of utamaro almost swooning tortured benumbed by that fullness of pleasure which stirs all the sensibilities of a body called woman oh the woman of utamaro your body is only of soft soft skin of smooth smooth flesh is your soul melted and your bone lost when you are sitting you twist your body and bend your neck you are always leaning against a pillar a railing or a chamber window sitting with upraised knee to attract attention to the roundness of the thigh bigger than the waist and exposing with such indifference the fair whiteness of the calf when you are standing you are wonderfully tall the long sleeves the trailing skirts though the dress you wear is sometimes a thin transparent gauze through which your arms your bosom and even the crimson crepe on your waist are seen still you hardly seem able to support its weight and i fear lest you fall though your hair is always dressed so faultlessly that there is not a single stray lock you never try to adjust your loosened sash are not the folds of your undergarments open and your dress almost slipping down from your shoulders what are you looking at when you stretch your long neck as you lift up your face is it the landscape the ferry-boat on the sumida river or do you hear the bustling sounds of ryogoku nay nay your small slender eyes must be following after the shadows of a dream that will never come to an end no wonder that you cover your mouth with one of your sleeves whenever you have to speak as if to say i cannot speak so shameful a thing no wonder that you hesitate touching the long hairpin with your slender fingers you seem to avoid the sunshine because it is too bright and the blue color of the sky because it is too deep oh the goddess of pleasure of the land of shamisen for whom even the blowing wind seems to soften when he observes your too delicate figure standing in the twilight of fear and shame and secrecy the passive woman of utamaro is lamenting the once tempting pleasure the lingering dream the flower viewing the shade of a huge cherry tree blooming in the fullest flower an afternoon of a beautiful spring day a sudden gale of wind scatters the snow of the falling flowers without reserve or compunction alas alas it is as though we behold all the sorrows of the world before our eyes lifting her long sleeves of furisode a little princess of about fourteen or fifteen years is turning her face aslant with her black hair that seems overweighted with ornaments from right and left the court ladies in maruwage in their bloom of middle age are covering the princess surprised by the wind with their sleeves of uchikake as a fence shaking off the snow of the falling flowers to-day will be the last of the flower viewing for this year leaving the poem in lamentation of the spring now let us go a pretty attendant maid of about seventeen or eighteen years is trying to fasten on a branch of the cherry tree a tanzaku on which the poem of parting with spring is written by the princess but the cherry branch is higher than the height of a plump maiden at seventeen or eighteen how can she reach it though she stretch herself so one of the attendant maids is on a cask of the sweet wine on which is written dai kanai or great luck 
the other is on the shoulder of a beautiful lad who looks almost like a girl at last the maid on the cask seems able to fasten the tanzaku on the branch the wind of the falling flowers blows her skirts and sleeves like pennants squatting on the earth one of the attending maids is holding the rather small cask lest it fall but her heavy sleeves are being blown by the violent wind the maid on the cask seems about to lose her balance as her white legs are nearly peeping forth from the flowing linings of the fluttering skirts she catches in one hand the branch and in the other she holds her skirts bending her slender body and passing the toes of her feet firmly bent inward she struggles to jump down quickly from her dangerous position but see the more fortunate one is the attendant maid on the shoulder of the beautiful lad the attendant lad who has been raised up to be a toy of women in the innermost chamber of the palace where there is no one but women is holding the attendant maid's waist firmly in his two hands as high as his pliant shoulders his face is downcast aslant how lovely is his mouth tightened at the corners showing the full force of his exertion in his features more delicate than those of a woman the rapture of heart and the pulsation of the bosom of the lifted maid is shown in the entanglement of her sleeves and skirts and the long knotted thongs tossed by the wind in spite of her endeavour with both hands holding the tanzaku she does not seem able to fasten it on the branch oh the calm inner garden in the spring the blowing storm the scattering cherry blossoms the princess surprised by the wind the attendant maid on the cask the beautiful lad lifting up the maid ah the symphonia of the delightful curves and the faded colours all revealed by the print of toyokuni the first the dream of the pleasure of the days that are no more night the bedchamber of women making the narrow room appear narrower in the short night near to the dawn the bamboo painted on the sixfold screen outspread conceals the ando light which is as motionless as though it were tired the hanging common garments are flowing comfortably in the softness of a thing called silk in the stifling warmth of the closed chamber from the faded colour of the red silk stealthily rises the odour of the skin and the remnant of the perfumes from powdered necks pleasantly they evaporate and drift through the darkness of the chamber where there is no man without even adjusting the loosened night-dress the pliant half-bodies of two women slip out from the turned-back bed-clothes of crimson crepe that look like pomegranates bursting by ripened maturity breathing flames come get up the cuckoo bird is cooing what a gloomy sound will you lift up the lamp wick i feel i am still dreaming by the light of ando trimmed the sound of the bird of night which is not a dream has ceased and from the tokonoma the place for decoration the peony flowers in a bronze vase show their gorgeous petals almost terrifying in their bloom at the bedside is a picture of love in an uncovered book of romance left as it was the evening before when she was reading it already come the sounds of a drum from the shrine of seishoko nearby no matter how the night of may hurries to the dawn in comfortable sleep in bed where the mind loosens like a thong in the bed chamber of women without men the day breaks not yet lo the ando the oil is gone end of the fifth story sixth story of polonia seven stories from contemporary japanese writers translated by torao taketomo this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Abai in October 2014. A Domestic Animal by Shimazaki Tozon. Her first misfortune was at her birth. 
she came into the world with short grey hair overhanging ears and fox-like eyes every animal which is called by favour domestic has a certain quality which attracts to itself the friendly feeling of man but she did not have it nothing in her countenance seemed to be favoured by man she was entirely lacking in the usual qualifications of a domestic animal naturally she was deserted however she was also a dog an animal which cannot live by itself she could not leave the hereditary habitat to be fed by people and then go back to the wild native place of her remote ancestors she began to search after a suitable human house this troublesome being strayed to the estate of kinsan a planter when the building of the new wood-roofed rent house was just finished the house was built along the village road of okubo located in such a manner as to enable one to go to the main street through the backyard the floor was high and the ground was dry moreover there was a narrow dark unoccupied space at the foot of the fence between this house and the next so that she could promptly hide herself in an emergency she lost no time in occupying this underground refuge the urgent necessity was to get the food there were two more rent houses on this estate which made four with the farm-like main house where kinsan's family lived these houses stood each against the other and trees with graceful branches were between them her sharp nose taught her first the direction toward the kitchen as she was hungry there was no time for choice peeled skins of fruits cold evil-smelling soup corrupt remnants of dishes she ate everything she could get if these were not enough to satisfy her she smelt around even the dust heap and hunted as far as she could hunt some dirty socks were soaked in the wash tub beside the well gladly she drank the water from the tub there was an old mokuse in the garden she decided to make of their shade her resting place stretching out her four legs on the ground which was warmed by the sunshine through the leaves she sighed or scratched the itchy spots when it was evening she entered her underground retreat and lay down on the charcoal bags which were under the floor above a large wash-tub she also tried sometimes she crept as far as the passage under the kitchen floor and slept on the charcoals in the warm charcoal box thus she began her life kinsan's family at this time kept a piebald dog of brown and white whose name was pochi this lively pochi was the only being who welcomed her pochi seemed to have a sociable nature he approached her politely scratching the ground she made her return greeting by shaking her dirty tail but kinsan and the others who lived on his estate did not receive her as pochi did isn't it a great loss to be ugly even among the animals remarked one i might keep her if she were a bit better said another all this was meaningless to her and she was called pup by these people who did not know each of the four houses had an aunt which was the name given to the hostess of the family not only these aunts but also their children laughed at and hated her and burst out railingly calling her pop pop as for the uncles they were more dreadful the least relaxing of her vigilance caused them to chase her many things were thrown at her stones clumps of clay the iron fire stick once a big club of the door guard was flung after her and made a wound on her hind leg gradually she understood the human mind the significant twist of the mouth a gesture as if to pick up something the shrugging of shoulders and the bitten lips all sentiments expressed against her showed to her the deep enmity of the hunter one day she was almost driven to bay in kinsan's kitchen nobody knows how she was able to find the means of escape people were crying bring the rope 
the rope the rope she was desperate and running through the garden where were the dwarf trees she went toward the hothouse turning around the barn she escaped to the fields where were the flowers to be sold on fete days gone at last said one of the uncles isn't she a troublesome thing replied kinsan who laughed like a good-natured man it was not only once or twice that she met such hard experiences but she was not a dog to be crushed down by this kind of hardship she would hunt around for food with calm composure with the appearance of saying this is my own territory boldly she stepped into the new kitchen of the rent house or went up to the veranda with her dirty feet she bit off the laces from the garden slippers and played with the washed things of the aunts smearing them with mud and dust she had no regard for the human children this family had a girl named ko chan who liked to come out to play in the yard in big wooden clogs trailing on the ground she chased this girl for fun sometimes ko chan would bring out a piece of tasty-looking cake and show it to her look here look here pop instantly she jumped at ko chan oh pop is wicked mamma this was always ko chan's cry for help then the aunt came hastily and called ko chan run away ko chan quick why do you wear such big clogs by this time poor ko chan had nothing left she had taken the cake from the crying ko chan thus securing the sweets which are eaten by man at such time she usually licked the top of her nose with her red tongue nevertheless there was no intention of good or evil in her actions these words she heard from the uncles and aunts of the estate but nothing about them was known to her she had no understanding of the etiquette and civility created by man she was only a dog whether her action was impolite or not that was not a question she was only a poor animal acting according to its nature the cold scanty miserable winter passed while she suffered this better go away treatment it was a wonder that she did not die from hunger the begging priest who used to come to okubo every morning said that even he did not get much as to the humble woman who took a child with her she was refused mostly by no business or nothing doing even human beings were in a sad state how then could they spare to this ignorant and useless animal this embarrassing dog a bowlful of their cold rice she roamed on the snow in the far-off places and ate everything even the skins of the orange meanwhile the spring has come and at the time when the frost began to melt she seemed to be quite grown up all the dogs from kinsan's pochi to kuro of the bathing-house akka of the timber dealers and the fearful big dog which was kept at the neighboring planters gathered around her wherever she goes she is followed by two or three dogs so a comfortable place like that shade of mokuse was overflowing with deep groans of dogs that sounded as if they wished to whisper or to flatter an aunt who came to the well side with a hand pail in her hand saw this sight my she said pop was a female dog i never noticed that and the aunt of the new rent house who happened to be there also said neither did i and the two aunts laughed greatly amused she ought to be banished such was the argument which was raised in the estate of kinsan among the members of the four families however the arguments raged between two parties the uncles and the aunts according to the point of view which was insisted upon by the aunts it was now different she was not in the condition she was formerly and it would be too pitiful if she were to have a baby as is expected of those with experience the aunts were sympathetic comparing her with themselves 
that may be so but how awful it would be if she gave birth to children this was the opinion held by the uncles indeed there was nobody who was not anxious about her future she did not know anything about this another day a carriage stopped at the door of kinsan there was something like a lidless box on this carriage which was covered with a dirty straw mat her quick nose smelt out what was in the carriage following after a policeman in uniform came a dubious looking man who entered the house but she was not roaming in such a dangerous place pochi kuro and the other dogs began to cry all at once now uncles aunts and all people of the village came out dog hunter mamma kochan hid herself behind her mother people ran around the garden kinsan's daughter whose daily duty it was to water the flowers ran out to the street with a dipper in her hand a middle school boy who was painting a watercolor picture followed them flinging away his tripod thither she escaped hither she ran the confusion itself was very extraordinary surely pup is killed ko chan said trembling at last she has escaped a man with a big oak club in his hand shook his head to his companion no use no use the policeman said and laughed when he went out the gate with disappointed looks the two men drew away the empty carriage anyway she had escaped with her life and by and by her bosom became larger her eyes began to be shaded with the restless color now she must guard not only herself but also her children within her womb thus the pleasant shade of mokuse was no more the place for security even when she was comfortably lying on the moist earth breathing out her agony for a while she stood up as soon as she saw the shadow of a man she could not be negligent even for a moment to her eyes there was nothing as merciless and cruel as the human being but in spite of her fear she could not leave the human house how at ease she would be if like other animals she could go to a distant forest and give birth amid the green trees and grasses thus it might seem to the looker-on but it was not so with her she was unable to change her inherited nature it was just at the beginning of june that she finished her duty of motherhood four puppies appeared in the hothouse of kinsan two of them were beautiful piebald puppies of brown and white like that of pochi one was entirely black and the other was of ambiguous gray very much like herself ah it was in the morning of her motherhood that she first saw the smiles of human beings it was also in that morning of her motherhood that she first had nourishing food since her birth pop come come opening the paper screen of the kitchen the aunt at kinsan's began to call her as she has called her since that day End of the sixth story. Seventh story of Polonia, Seven Stories from Contemporary Japanese Writers, translated by Torao Taketomo. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Abai in October 2014. Tsugaru Strait by Shimazaki Tozon. As my wife is hard of hearing, she cannot understand what I say unless I speak close to her ear in rather a loud voice. Though the time to go on board the ship was approaching, she was still leaning on the window at the first floor of the inn, and would not even prepare to start. Vacantly she was contemplating the sight of the dark green sea, the sea mews flying in groups, and the surugamaru, the regular liner which was about to start for Hakodate, ready to take us two on board. At such times she is always weeping, calling to her mind our departed son. 
this i noticed by the sight of her back i stroked her on the shoulder and urged her to start come get ready get ready the day was perfect for a voyage it was the time when the regular steamship lines were interrupted by the rumor that the russian ships from vladivostok which not long before had passed through tsugaru strait were appearing now and then along the pacific coast during five or six days only was this line between aomori and hakodate in operation as it was disappointing to my wife and myself to go home after having come so far and as the russian ships were said to be cruising on the open sea in the vicinity of oshima and the izu islands the very night before we had heard that the fleet of the enemy was sunk the announcement of which some of the newspapers printed in an extra we left the inn not worrying about the ships trusting somewhat to the truth of the statements in the extra there were soldiers in the streets in sober khaki-colored summer uniform watching us hurrying toward the pier as my wife was walking in meditation her slowness somewhat irritated me she suddenly stopped and this is what she said ah ah if only ryunosuke were living i would bring him with us to a place like this and give him pleasure she sighed ryunosuke was the name of our son i did not know what to do and putting my mouth close to her ear as if to scold her i said you will try me if you keep constantly calling him to mind instantly my wife flushed oh you are so cruel i am living only because of the consolation of his memory if you wish me not to speak of him bid me die my wife is tiresome for she is just a baby and i am only a nurse who is taking care of this infant of forty years tut tut how could you say such a thing in the street look everybody is turning and laughing at us i spoke thus but the words were not heard by my wife ah nothing is so hard to foresee as human life we never expected such a sad end to our son nor did we ever dream of going together for this journey it was caused by chance the daily accidents who can understand them it was unforeseen that we should pass a night at this far eastern port of oshu it was unforeseen that we should go aboard this ship above all it was unforeseen that we should be crossing tsugaru strait it was not long before the boat started she left the shore with the brave shouts of the boatmen in the nanbu accent the sailors of the ship were leaning on the bulwark looking down at the approaching boats filled with passengers unfortunately the first and the second classes were both full on that day although i was somewhat fearful on account of travelling with my wife to take the third class and be treated like cargo i concluded from experience that nothing is better than the deck in such fine weather instantly upon our arrival on the steamer we took our places at the prow meanwhile upon the stroke of the bell announcing ten o'clock the noisy sounds of the weighing anchor were heard the steam whistle was blown as if to bid farewell and it resounded through the sky overhanging the harbour the ship began to sail the deck where we took our place was near to the mast larger than one could reach around when the cool wind blew from the southwest sending the gay sunshine with the breezes i felt at last somewhat revived we spread the mat under the canvas shades and rested ourselves leaning on some of the cargo after a while i wanted to have a smoke but searching around my waist i found there was no tobacco pouch then gazing at my face my wife said you see surely you have left it again at the inn and she smiled this was quite a surprise to me i thought i was very composed but although i was constantly scolding my wife to brace her up it was proved by this oversight that my own dejection was more than that of hers now then i thought 
I myself must be somewhat queer, and I suddenly felt dispirited. The more I tried not to be overcome, the more my brain was oppressed with deep chagrin. No doubt I was becoming an idiot. The ship sailed out from the gulf of Aomori, leaving behind the lighthouse of Hiradate, white in the distance. The sun was mounting higher in the sky. The dark blue waves of the Japan current rolled in from the sea of Japan, broke resoundingly against the side of the ship, and sparkled in the sunshine. In the lazy hours of the voyage people came and went on the deck, pausing to admire the view. I also leaned on the bulwark and listened to the sound of the summer tides, filling my mind with the voice of the late July sea. Suddenly my thoughts were possessed by my son. Bitter recollections gushed up in my heart. It may sound strange, coming from a parent's lips, but, although he was only a boy when he died, he was clever enough to understand the joy and sorrow of life. My Ryunosuke was not a boy to be beaten by his fellow students in any of his studies. Observing the world, I noticed that the present age, lacking in faith, does not keep the young mind in quietude. Such was the short life of my son. Such an insatiable spirit as his could not help investigating the meaning of life from exploring all its works, its glories, and its decadences. Leaving the curious multitudes who looked upon him as a great fool in his misconceptions, how did he feel when he retired from his life, silently, with unutterable sorrow in his mind? The desperation of thought, if the word could be applied also to the life of this youth, this was certainly the transient but brave span of Ryonosuke. Pity that he was not a sage. He discovered that his learning made him ignorant. Alas, my son quit his studies, and his studies quit him. At last he went to Nikko, and died by throwing himself into the fall of Kegon. I shall never forget that day when my son came home quite unexpectedly and bade us farewell without telling us his intention, nor that evening when I gave him my last reproof. The next morning, and the second morning, there has been grief in every morning since that time. My wife became crazed, weeping and crying. It is your fault that you gave him such a reproof. Give me back my son alive, now, at once. It was inevitable. We were compelled to constrain her by force. We wrapped her in quilts, holding her. We scolded and cajoled her. But the strength of the crazed woman was almost more than ours. I myself did not eat nor sleep regularly for seven days. Indeed, the condition of my wife at that time was such that it would not have been impossible for her to have followed our son, to have thrown herself into the waterfall of Nikko Mountain. When she became a bit calmer, I thought of a plan, which was this journey. I hoped that her distressed mind might be cured by seeing some of the famous places. As she had exquisite taste, in spite of her appearance, I thought I might be able to buy some ubi or sashes, if she cared for them. Inducing her to see the modern fashions, hoping to quiet her, we started out on this journey. Alas, my son! After he had passed through the bitterest sufferings, at the moment he came to think about death, even he could hardly have dreamt of his father becoming an idiot and his mother a lunatic, weeping during the day, thinking during the night, and roaming thus far to the northern sea. I, who am speaking this, am only a man who has spent a most ordinary but peaceful and quiet life in the country. How could I foresee that this peaceful life would change abruptly in its forty-third year? Seeking relief, we felt like wandering pilgrims. Inhaling the sea air of July, two fools were listening to the dreamy sounds of the waves, meditating upon the death of their only child. Strange imaginings came into my mind. 
if the dead body should float up from the basin of that waterfall and be borne away by the current where would it go nowhere but into this ocean yes yes this restless place of wind and wave this must be the grave of my son here ryonosuke must be sleeping for ever and ever thus in fancy i was indulging my thoughts when the bell of twelve o'clock resounded through the ship for lunch a bento in a square luncheon box was distributed to each of the passengers we could not eat ours on account of the boiled cuttlefish but two young men who came with their own luncheons took their seat close to us and began to eat with gusto one of them looked as though he were accustomed to labor he reminded me of anko san the young men who are said after indulgence in wine and women to draw the snow sledges at such a place as goryokaku the other boy looked two or three years younger than his friend and seemed just about the age of my son apparently he was a student as was shown by his naive appearance and then the youthfulness of the expression about his eyes when he looked at the sea through his spectacles was singularly like that of ryunosuke there is such a thing as the haunting resemblance of the stranger however i was quite surprised in my own mind wondering whether it was possible for any one else to see such a resemblance how i gazed rubbing my eyes at the silhouette of the student as for my wife i looked at her and saw she entertained the same feeling when we looked at each other we understood our mutual thought without a word ah it is unreasonable that i should meet my dead son on this ship and it was a trick of my imagination that caused me to think that only if i should address him he would speak to me saying father father and taking my hand would complain of the mysteries and fears and agonies of the other world surely he is my son my ryunosuke such an absurd thought could only spring from the foolish heart of a parent i do not know how often i repeated ryunosuke ryunosuke in my mind i was tempted to cry out in a loud voice and was astonished at my own absurdity at last i addressed the young man pardon me where do you come from i the student smiled i came from goshu goshu then you came from a long way off yes i have an uncle in sendai and came up to ask his assistance but as i found him absent being called out for war anyway i'm going up to hokkaido to try to find some work there i have been told that there is profitable employment at sapporo if i cannot find work in sapporo i may go even to ashigawa is that so mm, young man ought to be that way you do not need to worry you will find plenty of work if only you have a mind to do it thus comforting him i recognized the simple cheerful and yet manly temperament of this student now and then the older companion glanced stealthily toward us with distrustful looks i could not understand why the student had such a companion i inquired of him and was told that they became comrades by chance they seemed not especially friends nor men from the same district in other words they were only fellow wanderers my wife took out some apples from her package these were bought the evening before at aomori from a basket when we were surrounded by the women who sell fruit ryunosuke was fond of things with a delicate flavor which my wife seemed to remember as if to give them to her son she selected the alluring yellow apples from the green ones and recommended them to the two young men i told the younger one in detail of the loss of my son and the reason of starting on this journey with my wife who cannot hear well and added this also must be the work of fate to meet you in this place please take one of them don't be ceremonious come they are so kind let us accept them said the companion as he pushed forth impudently 
please do so i urged them offering my knife my wife was leaning on me like a child and gazing at the hands of the student paring the apple tears of memory seemed to flow ceaselessly down her cheeks forgetting everything even our bodies we longed for the recalled face of our son whom we never expected to see in this world the student and his companion bit the apples like hungry animals so that even the crunching sounded delicious and ate them heartily with vigor and appetite sweet isn't it whispering to his companion the student smelled the flavor of the apple squinting his eyes sweet the companion also tasted his eagerly by the time the one o'clock bell had rung all of the passengers were tired of their journey some of them were lying down with their packages as pillows some were sleeping on the deck with their mouths open like fishes the reports of the russo japanese war which were much discussed about the mast had entirely ceased there was nobody on this ship who did not desire speedily to reach hakodate the only passengers who wished to continue the journey as long as possible in this way were ourselves that was because we knew there were only three hours more to be with this young man and be reminded of ryunosuke after parting from him here we were not sure that we should ever meet him again nay not only should we never see again our son but we should probably never again in our lives see the face that resembled his you are gazing at something aren't you the student stepped out and patted the shoulder of his companion the companion turned to him look at that smoke smoke it is strange that smoke appears in this direction let me see where no there is no smoke nothing like it why can't you see it wondering at the conversation of these two men i also left the side of the mast far off to the east of the strait the dark farther tide on which groups of cuttlefish are accustomed to ride down that curial tide dipping the horizon shone white and yellow under the rays of the sun groups of clouds were floating in the sky the excessive heat of a midsummer noon on the thirtieth of july seemed to burn the sea the sky above the horizon was a dark gray mingled with purple the air was hazy but nothing like smoke was to be seen before i realized it the captain who for some time had been reading the law of general average went up to the bridge and was eagerly looking through the marine glass suddenly we felt uneasy the ship had probably sailed at a fair speed since leaving aomori when she was sailing at full speed toward cape oma which was on her starboard side the cloud of smoke was seen exactly in that direction after twenty minutes a second smoke appeared then a third the vladivostok fleet which was said to have appeared along the coast of the pacific ocean was slowly sailing from cape oma to cape tatsuhi approaching nearer the ships became more distinct when the three gray ships of the enemy of portentous appearance were seen approaching our defenseless vessel sailors and passengers all stood up the battle formation of the enemy was in single line first came the rossia then the gronboy with the riorik a little behind them joyful or sad memories or imaginings were all blotted out by this unexpected view nobody remained in the dark cabin forgetting the vertigo the nausea and the sufferings of fatigue the hundred and fifty passengers came out at once on deck all those who have been standing at the stern passed through the kitchen and pressed toward the prow go down go down go down if you want to save your life but the cries and scoldings of the sailors could not control the confusion of the excited men screaming women and children the dreadful sound of the engine gave an added touch of gloom as the enemy were known to be such vicious fighters that they sank even the sailing boat seishomaru and robbed it of the money and cargo all on board felt that there was no time for delay 
they bared their feet and tucked up their skirts in order to be as prepared as possible i will take charge of your wife the words of the student were hardly heard having already lost her colour my wife stood shuddering close to the student death we were face to face with that force a group of sailors took off the duck rain covers from the lifeboats to prepare them for lowering at any moment as it was the captain's hope to be within the limit of the protection of the fort if only the ship could run one hour more at full speed the ship dashed along with all possible speed nay even with a desperate force rather than speed in this dangerous situation there appeared suddenly from the direction of hakodate our fleet running in the same direction as the russian ships the enemy also saw this fleet and seeming to hesitate stopped their advance the fact is that it was the time when they took the last resolution to pass the tsugaru strait again sending up volumes of black smoke they began all at once to flee like a flock of birds with the exclamation of banzai banzai all the people on the deck shook their hats toward our fleet now we are safe turning back to my wife i sighed with relief safe i repeated my wife was still leaning on the shoulder of the student as my wife and i turning again to the thought of our son settled down to spend the few remaining hours in conversation with the student the mount gagyu appeared to our view we caught sight of the red cliff jutting into the sea the rugged precipice from whose surface the reflection of the sun shone white on the sky of the port of hakodate a seagull flew near to the bulwark as if to congratulate us on our safe arrival we arrived at the entrance of the port at the appointed hour four o'clock ah how great the joy of the people when they saw the streets of hakodate from the deck the grey roofs of planed board on the slope of the mountain the new ridge poles soaring among the houses built in nanbu style of stone and sand the landscape covered with the green leaves of matsubuna and itaya from the high tower of the temple shining in sunlight to the custom house hospital and the buildings of many schools this prospect of the port of new japan extended before our eyes exciting our interest the enormous group of people gathered on the seashore raised a wild shout of joy to welcome the safe arrival of the liner the surugamaru also made the air resound with whistles passing through the many sailing ships steamboats cargo boats sampans and lighters the surugamaru approached the pier looking like a scared water bird who had barely escaped from peril and was hurrying to the shore crying out to her friends when the ship stopped and seemed to sigh with relief the waves lapped around her with whisperings then the passengers jumped into the sampans and hastened to land on the pier what a sight of madness persons landing persons waiting to receive them parents embracing their children sisters their sisters caressing and embracing all the women wept for joy which stirred the emotion of all onlookers at last the time came to part with the student full of regret i was standing vacantly in the crowd and forgot not only the clamouring hotel runners but everything even to the package i placed on the ground and the bag i was carrying wishing only to continue speaking with this young man how i was moved at this unexpected intimacy and this parting thinking over the events of the day's voyage becoming conscious of the disappearance of his companion we turned back and saw his arm firmly taken by a big policeman there pickpocket said those who gathered around us look what are you thinking about don't you know you have been robbed being addressed by the policeman i was aware for the first time that the package i had placed on the ground was gone what impudent exclaimed the student excitedly i am not such a man as to commit lawlessness don't be excited where did you come from 
I myself did not see you break the law, but you are the companion of the man who did it, aren't you? As the policeman said this, I told him every fact I knew, and defended the student from the imputation of being a suspicious character. The policeman nodded at each of my words, and, after he inquired of the student how he became a companion of such a scoundrel as the pickpocket, he made more inquiries and admonitions, and also advised me to appear against the thief in court. Wait a bit. I want to keep your name and address. The policeman took out his notebook and gazed at the face of the student. What is your address? Kusatsu Town, Awata District, Omi County. Your name? Nishihara Yasutaro. Your age? Nineteen. After this catechism, the student bade farewell to my wife and me, and started again on his wanderings. I looked at the appearance of his back as he disappeared, and could not help being again reminded of my departed Ryunosuke. My wife, weeping and scarcely able to stand, looked after him, leaning on my shoulder. Gazing this way and that, we continued to look until the straw summer hat, the student-like figure in the white cloth of Kasuri, disappeared amid the crowd, and at last faded away. End of the Seventh Story End of Polonia, Seven Stories from Contemporary Japanese Writers Translated by Torao Taketomo Thanks for listening.